Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. Welcome to another DXO webinar. I'm your host, Photo Joseph, and today we are going to be exploring black and white filtration, black and white effects, black and white fun, specifically with landscape photos, um, with one extra yeah, pseudo landscape that I threw in because it's just a really cool photo, makes a cool demo, but it's all about black and white, playing with the tools that we have in there, starting with the presets, playing with some of the color filters, adding green control points, and a couple other uh, uh, fancy tricks thrown into boot. So welcome once again, I'm Photo Joseph, I'm your host. The topic today, the title of today's show, dive deeper into color filters and film types on landscape images with Silver FX Pro. Running through a little bit more specific of what we're hitting today. Um, again, focusing on landscape photography. Like I said, I already got one little extra one thrown in there just for fun. We're gonna look at how color filters can bring up the contrast on your landscapes and clouds. We're gonna look at one-click solutions with the film types to get instant results because there's always so much fun to be found in there. And we're going to look at customizing the grain sensitivity and levels and curves for that perfect end result. Really what it comes down to today is I'm going to be exploring a series of photos and we're going to look at how these photos can get treated using all the different tools in there. There's gonna be a bit of um, kind of randomly jumping around between these topics just because certain things apply to certain photos better than others. And so, you know, at the end of the day, the result, the, the desired result is to get the best photo possible. And that's what we're going to do. All right, so the first thing that I wanna focus on is color filters in black and white. It's a really interesting topic that if you have never shot black and white film, then you've probably never really put too much thought into how this works or what it is. The idea from a high level perspective is that with color filters, we're talking actual pieces of glass, going back to the old days of shooting film. When you're shooting black and white film, you could put colored glass, red, blue, green, orange, yellow, colored glass filters over your camera. And when you look through the lens, well, this is film, so you didn't see a visual black and white image. You saw the color image with a red or blue or whatever color filter on it. And it made that kind of photography a little bit tricky because you really had to know in your head what was going to happen with those color filters. Skip forward to digital photography and the need of using color filters on the camera goes away. We don't need to do that anymore, but we can still take advantage of the premise of it, of the basic ideas of it. So here's here's how we're gonna do this. I've got a web page up. Uh, let's see here, here we go. I've got a web page up. This is from a website called photographymad.com. I'm uh, using their image today. And this has a illustration on it that shows what happens with particular colors when you apply a color filter. So to understand how to read this, looking down the left-hand side where you see all the little color chips, this is your original photo. So reds in your photo, orange and yellows in your photo, greens and then blues and purples in your photo. And how would they, how would they translate to black and white with these color filters on them? So here's no filter. And this shade of red turns into this dark gray with no filter applied and that lighter, brighter red goes to that gray and this yellow goes to that gray and so on and so on. When you add a color filter, this is how it changes. So if you add a red filter, the red becomes this very light gray, almost white. And on the opposite end of that spectrum, the blues become quite dark, almost black. We look at yellow, yellow gets a little bit darker in the reds, a little bit brighter in the blues and greens, um, whereas the yellow gets very, very bright. Effectively what's happening is the color filter, again, now we're talking back to the analog days, the color filter is allowing that color through while blocking the other colors. And similar to dodging and burning, if you think about the effect of dodging and burning something, when you allow more light through, that's going to get brighter, right? It's just like exposing your sensor or your film for longer, that gets brighter, while anything that doesn't come through as much or for as long gets darker. So the colors that are allowed through are effectively exposing the film or the sensor more, getting brighter, and the colors that are blocked or restricted are darker. And that's how this whole thing works. And if we look at, I'm gonna go over to PhotoLab real quick here and just pull up the color wheel. Um, not to make any changes, but just to bring a color wheel up and then go back to this, um, to this chart here. If we look at the opposites, you'll see that it's largely the opposite of a color filter that gets blocked. So what will get darker? And again, the color of the color filter itself will get brighter. So if we're looking at the red, we'll look at red color and then the red filter, and that's getting brighter. And then blue is getting darker. And if we look over here at the color wheel, 
the opposite of the red is this kind of bluish area here. And it's not a totally linear, exactly across the wheel kind of a shift, but it's basically that other side and somewhere in that area. If we look at you know, yellow, yellow gets brighter. So here's our yellow color, yellow filter, yellow color plus yellow filter means very bright. So that's the white area here. The opposite side of that's gonna be this kind of bluish to purple. And if we look down here to the bluish and purples, those are getting darker down here. So that's how that all works. Now it's interesting to know this going into it, but you don't have to. I mean, you can just start pushing the buttons and see what happens, but it is always interesting to understand the premise of what is actually happening there. So now with all that out of the way, let's jump back over here to PhotoLab. I'm going to take this filter, this photo here that's got a uh, bright blue sky. We've got a darker blue up in the corner, fading out to kind of a lighter blue on the right side. We clearly have green in the uh, in the scene as well with a little bit of yellow and browns in the foliage. And so this photo should respond quite well to the color filters. I'm going to go ahead and do all of this in the net collection because that's just fun. We're going to go into Silver Effects Pro. And within Silver Effects Pro, we have our black and white color filters. Let's load this guy up in here. Here we go. And I'm gonna start with neutral. I'm not gonna apply any presets or any other adjustments here. All I wanna do is play with the filters. These are over here on the right-hand side. You see the color filters and we see the row of them. Now, just in case anybody here is new to Silver Effects Pro, let me give you a quick tour of this before we jump into the color filter part of it. In Silver Effects Pro, all of the adjustments that you do, so global adjustments, brightness, contrast structure, as you open these up, you'll see more kind of uh, sub settings, if you will, to those the uh, color filters, the film types that we have here, so we can choose from different film types, grain sensitivity, and then finally finishing and adjustments. All of these are applied globally, applied to the entire photo. If you want something applied to a specific area of the photo, then that all comes down to the selective adjustments control points in here. And we are, of course, going to play with all of this throughout the day today. Over on the left-hand side, you have your presets, where you have a variety of different presets that you can choose from. Each one of these presets is simply a combination of settings over here on the right that are being applied to the image. What you'll find as I play with these today is that the presets, nice big thumbnails as you can see on the left there, the presets are a great way to explore these options, explore the opportunities and see what you can do within, uh, within the tool. Without having to drag 500 sliders, you just click through the presets and off you go. So that brief tour out of the way, let's go back over to the color filters. We are, there is a massive truck that has just pulled up in front of my building. Sorry about that. Um, we're going to run through the color filters. It starts off with no filter applied. So that's this right here, nothing has been applied. And you, know, you can think about this process. What's gonna happen if I click on the red filter? If I click on the red filter, what colors are gonna get brighter? Well, the red colors, but there's not a whole lot of red in here. So we're not really gonna get a lot of brighter reds, but what is the opposite of that red? Well, let's go back to our chart real quick. And so the opposite of the red is the blues. So the blues should get considerably darker. Well, this scene has a whole lot of blue, right? We go back to photo lab. It's got a whole lot of blue in here. So let's go into, uh, where were we? Into Silver Effects Pro. And I'm gonna click on the red and sure enough, that darkens the blue there. We can see that the sky has gotten darker. The clouds are kind of popping out a little bit more. If we toggle this back and forth here, you'll see that the difference here in the sky is it made those the sky darker and the clouds a bit brighter and you get that really beautiful contrast in the sky with just one filter click. And this is this is one of the, uh, if you, again, thinking back to the film days, why you would use these filters. If you're shooting landscape photos, you're shooting nature photos like this, putting that red filter on there would give you that really strong pop to the sky without having to do anything else. Um, and certainly this is not the kind of thing you can easily do in the dark room. Can you imagine trying to dodge and burn the sky, but not the clouds. I mean, forget about it, right? That'd be really, really hard. But by putting on that red filter on the camera, you get that look. And here again, we are able to um, get that look instantly just here in software. We can also adjust the, the colors of the filters. We can kind of make our own color filters in here and adjust the strength of them. So if we wanted to get a little bit more intense red, we can do that and then really, really bring up the contrast in that sky in there. Now the red in there is just one filter choice, right? We can play with the other one. So let's go back to our original color photo. And we had green in here as well. So if I add a green filter, it's gonna make those really bright. Is that gonna work out? I don't know, let's find out. Let's go in here and reset this, hit the green filter on there, and it does add a little bit of brightness into the foliage, kind of pops it up a little bit. Maybe the yellow will look better. 
you know, either one of these is, is going to give you a slightly different result. But the point here is that you are able to choose what colors you want to make brighter or darker through the color filter process. So it's just a really fun way to um, to take care of this. All right, I'm gonna um, I'm gonna turn off my webcam for now. I will bring it back up later on when we um, when we uh, do the Q and A, just to make there make sure there's a little bit more room for you to see what's going on on screen. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you about color filters. Again, keeping an eye on this chart, and by all means, I encourage you to uh, to look up this chart if you want to. PhotographyMad.com has this great article about it with this great color chart that can help, and it's just always interesting and educational to understand the basics of it. All righty. So let's uh, let's see here. I'm actually there's a question that already came up. I want to hit this right now. Um, so I guess I will turn my camera back on. Bob has said I was taught that a color filter lightens its own color and darkens its complement. Is that still a true premise? Precisely, and it's because it is allowing that color through. So a a um, a blue filter will allow blue color through more, restricting other colors back, meaning that those don't come in as much, meaning they don't expose the film or the or the sensor as much. In this case, I was demonstrating red worked the best with this. It is allowing the red through, blocking that blue. So the blue colors, the blue sky, doesn't expose the film or the sensor as much. Therefore, it becomes darker. So the blue becomes darker. So that color filter, its color becomes brighter. The opposite becomes darker. And that is the effective premise of it. Awesome. All right. So with that one done, I'm just going to cancel out of SilverFX Pro here and let's play with an actual photo that we're going to do some editing on. I'm going to go to this cloud photo here. Scenix clouds, love this. This is uh, this is sunrise. I think it, this is in Hawaii. I think I'm um, Haleakala, if I remember right. This is a long time ago. You'll see this is only a Canon 20D, so a very low resolution. It's only an eight megapixel sensor on here. Uh, you know, if we look at it 100%, it barely gets any bigger, which is kind of funny. But let me reset this. And I'm going to take this into SilverFX Pro. But before I do, I'm going to do a little bit of editing in PhotoLab. This is always my process. Before I take it into a filter, I'll do some base editing in here. And if I look at this picture here, it's uh, obviously got these very dark, contrasty clouds, which is probably fine. However, I might want to pull a little bit of texture into here. So I'm going to raise the exposure just a little bit. Let's see what happens if I bring this up. So as I bring that up, I'll see there is some texture in here, but man, there is a lot of, I don't know if it's noise or just weird sensor pattern. There's a lot of junk happening in here very, very quickly. So I do want some additional texture coming in here, but I'm gonna have to be really, really careful of this. It's just such an old sensor. Um, it's really, it's not even noise, it's like this weird pattern, but it's kind of exhibiting like noise a little bit. So I'm gonna try using Deep Prime in PhotoLab to see if I can knock some of that back. I'm not gonna bring it up that much, but I am gonna bring it up a little bit. In fact, let's just do it like this. Let's bring up just the shadows a bit. There we go, bring up the shadows a little bit. You can probably see some of that noise coming in here, um, coming in here a little bit too much. So I am going to try out Deep Prime. So let's go over here to, where am I going? Um, denoising, there we go. We're gonna use Deep Prime on here. If you're not familiar with Deep Prime, Deep Prime is a very advanced noise reduction algorithm, which you don't actually see on the photo as it's applied, you only see it on export. So if I turn on Deep Prime and then I drag my preview area somewhere over the clouds like this, where we can see all the noise happening in there. If we look at it in the preview window here, this is where we will see the difference. So if I click and hold on here, you'll see the original, you can see, and I understand that sometimes through GoToWebinar, a lot of the really fine details don't show up, but there's a whole lot of noise happening in there. I take my finger off the mouse and we now see that nice and smooth. So I'm gonna take advantage of Deep Prime for this filter effect. I'm now going to send this off to SilverFX Pro. And again, because I enabled Deep Prime over here, that, that uh, noise algorithm is gonna be applied to the TIFF file that is rendered off and sent out to SilverFX Pro. So here we are. Now we've got this in here. Now I already know that if I push this too far, I am gonna see some of that, that weird pattern show back up, but that's okay, because we are going to fix that while we're in here. All right, now let's just, let's uh, explore some of the presets. This is a good opportunity to explore presets and see what we get out of these. So let's say you're looking at a photo like this and you're just not really sure what direction to take it. So we try presets, a little underexposed, a little overexposed, a little high contrast preset, a little bit more high contrast. 
structure. Now I'm going to tell you right off when it comes to black and white structure, especially with clouds, structure can be super fun. You can find some really wild stuff in here. So I can pretty much guarantee you that I'm going to spend a lot of time playing with structure in various photos in here. But again, going through the presets, just trying off the different ones to see what's in there can give you some really interesting ideas of where you might want to go. And I can tell from here that I'm definitely going to want to enhance the contrast and the the structure in the clouds back here because it just looks so so cool and um, ooh, a little bit of grain might be okay as well so we'll, we'll experiment with that um, and i am going to want to be careful of these dark clouds i do want some of this additional texture that i brought in so it's not just a big black blob on there but i want to make sure that i don't go too far and end up bringing some of this crazy um, weird striations from the sensor coming back in so I'm going to go back here. There was one that I liked. We'll start with this, this number five high structure. And I'm digging the way this looks. However, we are seeing too much of the weird pattern showing up in these clouds in here. So I think what I'll do is use control points to reduce some of the structure in here. If we look at the global settings, structure has been applied globally. We'll see it up here. Structure is about 33%. And you, know, you can grab this slider and drag it up and down and see what the differences are. If I drag this way up, we really get some cool stuff happening here, but this cloud goes really, really bad. If I take it the other way, take it down to zero, we still have a little bit of that structure showing up in there just because of the contrast that's been applied. If I take it all the way down, it actually eliminates most of it by doing negative structure. So this tells us something interesting. We might be able to get rid of some of this by applying negative structure on the um, on just the clouds themselves. So to do that, I'll go to my control points, drop a control point on this cloud, let's make it nice and big. And I wanna see what's gonna be affected. So I'll open up the control point and enable the mask. And here we can see very clearly what part of the image is going to be affected. Now, if you've never used control points before, just a very quick overview of how these work. A control point is building a mask in real time based off of the luminance and chrominance, that's the brightness and the color values, of the area that you have dropped your center point on. So you can see how the mask changes as I move this around. If I drop that up to the sky, it's gonna affect that part of the sky. As I go down onto the clouds here, it's selecting different parts of the scene to edit. And I want to select the majority of this big cloud in here so I can kind of move this around and find a spot that really covers the majority of what I want. And that looks pretty good. So let's hide the mask. So we haven't done anything to the image yet. All I've done is added a control point, but I haven't made any changes to it. And now I'm gonna to go to my structure slider and I'm gonna dial in that negative structure, but only over the clouds in here. Now at this point, I'm still seeing a little bit of the lines in there. So, you know, there's there gets to a point with some photos where there's just nothing you can do about it to get rid of it. So it's time to start hiding things. And I'm gonna hide this using grain. I'm gonna go over to my film types, open up the grain, I'm not gonna have to add much. In fact, let me go to 100% before I do this. I zoom into 100% on here. And you know, zooming into 100%, it doesn't make much of a difference because it's such a low resolution file to begin with. But now I'll take this green per pixel slider and then drag that down just a little bit, just until I start to see the pattern break up in there, which right about there, that's looking pretty good in there. Maybe we could add a little bit more, a little bit more, really break that up. There we go. So now we've gotten rid of that pattern in there, or at least the majority of it. And, um, and I'm pretty happy with that. So now let me go back to the cloud up here. I feel like I have I could have some more structure in the, um, in the sky back here. So I'm gonna take another control point, drop it on here, make that nice and big, and we'll go the opposite direction, adding structure into it. So now I've added structure into this part of the sky, removed the structure from this part of it, and then ending up with a more balanced image that has that cool look to it without going crazy in the, um, uh, in the structure on here and by eliminating also eliminating some of that weird pattern that we had so there's an approach so again this is how we kind of go about these things we look at the presets we find somewhere as a good starting point and then dive in and start making the refined adjustments to them i'll go ahead and save this uh, i'm going to turn on the save and edit later option just in case i want to come back to this and i'll hit save and then let me jump over to the questions because there's a couple of them that have come in all right, first question, can you add more than one color filter? And if so, would you want to? So you can't because the this is designed to act like the real world. And if you were to add multiple filters in the real world, it's not going to, let's say you added blue and red. They're effectively gonna cancel each other out. You can't, um, you can't say, okay, enhance the blue 
right? And enhance the red because these are not, it's just light coming through in an analog world, right? So you can't separate those out. Digitally, you can do that, but you would go about it with different tools. You wouldn't go about it with the color filters. The color filters are designed there to, to emulate that old world way of doing it. If you wanted to brighten the blues, darken the reds, um, or whatever uh, at the same time, then you would use the control points to go in there and just manipulate that part of the scene the way that you wanted it. So the answer is no, you wouldn't do it with the color filters. It would not give you, in the real world, it would not work. It's physically not possible. In the digital world, it's just designed to work like it did in the analog world, so you'd go at it at a different approach. Next question, so you can use the control point to select specific areas within the different color filters. Um, it was a you can or a can you. I'm not sure if that was a question or a statement. Let me let me jump into here. And there is not a color. Uh, let's see, I'm going to go ahead and overwrite the original. One. There is not control points within the color filters themselves. And I don't believe the control points have color filter adjustments, but that's what we're going to check. And I don't think they do. So if I open up the color filters, we only have hue and strength controls over those filters. I don't have. Uh, control points just for this. If I do add a control point and I open this up, yeah, we don't have RG red, well, we don't have a color filter setting in here. So the options that you have within the control points are brightness, contrast, structure, amplify whites, amplify blacks, fine structure, and then selective colorization, which allows you to bring some color back into the scene. So no, you don't have color filters through control points. Yeah, and that answers that question. Okay, next question. Can you show us how to mask again? Well, I will come back to the control points a couple of times throughout uh, throughout the presentation today. Was the grain applied to the whole photo? Yes, or just within the control point area? The grain was applied to the whole photo. So again, to reiterate that, everything you see on the right-hand side is global. This is applied to the entire image. The only thing that's applied locally is the what is inside of the control points. So the control points are brightness, contrast, structure, et cetera. So the grain is not something that is applied as a control point. Grain is something that is applied globally. If you wanted to apply grain locally, then you could do that with the um, with Color Effects Pro. So you could do your black and white image here in Silver Effects Pro, not apply the grain, and then go into Color Effects Pro and choose a grain layer, grain filter, and localize that. So that's how you would do it. You would combine the two filters together. So that would be uh, that would be my approach to uh, to do that. Um, can someone has asked if you can get an infrared look in Silver Effects Pro? There is not an infrared. Well, actually, I take that back. Maybe there is an infrared preset. Let's see here. Um, what am I looking for? Let me reset this. Let's get rid of this guy. Uh, all. Let's just look at all. I'm scanning through. I think there might be something that kind of s emulates that. Loki, Loki, Loki. Push, grad, grad, full dynamic, full dynamic, full spectrum, full spectrum, fine art. Um, I don't, I have very little experience working with infrared. I have a, I had, I don't own it. Um, I borrowed a friend's infrared converted camera once. That was really fun to play with. But I've never really tried to make an infrared look out of a non-infrared photo. Um, I feel like I've seen one before, but I'm not seeing anything in there now. There certainly is not, I'm not finding it. I might've scrolled past it and not spotted it. Um, there is not an infrared button per se. There's not something that just says, oh, make this look infrared. Actually, let's check the film types. That might be another place to hide something. Um, no, I'm not seeing anything there either. So I'm going to say no, there is not. I believe, I believe in one of the other um, tools, there might be one. I think analog effects might have an infrared. Sorry, I don't know offhand. I don't want to spend any more time digging through it. Um, I know, I'm pretty sure that there are some infrared-ish kind of looks that are in some of these, but I don't remember exactly where they are. Sorry about that. Okay, now moving on. Let's see here. I'm going to turn this camera back off. And um, where's my, which photo am I doing next? Ah, yes. Next, we're going to do this one. This photo, yellow, this photo is going to really show us some uh, um, 
uh, possibilities with the control point. So here we have a landscape of the Great Wall of China. We've got a really nice, good dramatic sky in the background, but the overall photo to start with is a bit on the flat side and, um, and where there's a lot of room for improvement in here. So let's start by figuring out what we've got to work with. As always, the first thing I wanna do is see exactly what data I do and don't have. Initially looking at this, if I zoom in close up here to the sky, this looks like it's blown out and that I have lost texture in here that I don't have any detail. Do I have detail there or not? Well, let's find out. I'll do that by going to the exposure slider and just dragging that down and seeing what's in there. And it turns out there is actually a fair amount of detail in there. Excellent. So that's very, very good to know. I've got tons of detail in there. If I zoom back out and raise the exposure up, I can see what I've got in the foreground. And once again, there is a lot in there. So this camera has captured a very nice amount of dynamic range. It's definitely a bit hazy back here. We can see that. We're going to have to do some work to pull it all together, but we've got the raw data to work with. So I'm going to pull the sky down by using Selective Tones highlights. And I'll pull these down, pull these down, pull these down until I get some nice texture in the uh, brightest spot of the clouds up there. So that's awesome. Um, so when it, I'm being told that there is an infrared film filter in ColorFX Pro. Excellent. Thank you. So let's see. So I pulled that down. I've got a really nice looking sky up there. Now it's a little bit flat over here. I kind of lost some of the excitement, but I pulled in that detail. So that's good. This has got a little bit dark down there. So I'm going to raise my shadows up a little bit. I don't want to go too high. I'm looking at my histogram. I'm definitely flattening things out right now, but I'm okay with that because I know that I'm going to bring some of this contrast back in once I get into SilverFX Pro. The main thing I want to make sure is that I am not losing my, my beautiful highlights, beautiful detail in the clouds up here. So I think this is a pretty good starting point. Did I go too high on the shadows? Yeah, I think it's all right. We're going to use this as a starting point. Send this off to the Knit Collection to SilverFX Pro 2. Now, let's see what we can do to this photo in here. This is super flat. As a black and white right now, it looks really, really flat and boring, which is kind of fun because when we get done with this picture, you're going to be like, wait, we started with this? So if we go through the presets, starting with something like the high structure, we'll see that there is a lot going on in here. Um, we can easily get some solarization along the edge here, so we're going to have to watch out for that. But we can see what's happening with the structure in the uh, in the trees in here, in the foliage, it looks really cool, and in the sky. So, I mean, overall, we've got a lot to work with in here, but I am just going to do this totally by hand from the beginning, and I'm going to do this by starting with a overall structure, and let's see what we get here. So, bring up overall structure a bit, and I want to go too crazy because I don't want to get the solarization along the edge of the, the mountain range in there, but with a little bit in there, we can see that we've added some nice texture into the foliage and a little bit into the clouds, but, you know, nowhere near enough. So let's just jump into control points. I'm going to grab a control point, drop it here on the first part of the clouds. So let's verify what I'm looking at. Again, to verify that, enable the mask view. This is, all this is doing is showing you the mask. And of course, at this point, I can drag this around to, to adjust what is going to be chosen and to reiterate how this is being done. This is a mask that is being built in real time based off of the luminance and chrominance of the area that I have selected. So as I move up to different parts of the clouds, different parts of the, um, the foliage down here, different parts of the sky without the cloud, then we are seeing a totally different mask being built. So you can very quickly, very easily create that perfect mask in there. So that mask is on there. I'm now going to brighten or inverse brighten, darken the clouds on here. I want to get a nice dark cloud in there. And I'm going to take that structure up as well and just really pop some life into that. Cool. Yeah, that's all right. There we go. So we got some real good drama showing up in there. All right, good. And now let's look at the sky up here. Do another control point up here. I'm just going to make it kind of big. I'm not even going to bother checking the mask. I'm just going to darken that a little bit, take the structure up a bit. Oh, yeah. Look at that kind of cool clouds coming through. And man, we are getting some pretty dramatic sky showing up in there. So that's cool. All right, we're off to a good start here. I dig the dark, dramatic, brooding, moody clouds over here. We got some great texture up here. It looks like a little bit of a storm rolling in and we're off to a good start. Now let's focus on the foreground in here. The wall in here is clearly standing out from the background, but could it stand out even more? Could we brighten up this wall even more? Well, we're going to do this using control points, and we're going to get pretty heavy with the control points here. I'm going to start by adding one control point, dropping it onto the wall there, 
enabling the mask. And right away, we can see that well, we can, in fact, do a pretty good job of separating out that wall. So it's it's a very subtle difference. Let's zoom into 100% here. Um, again, not a very high res photo, so we're not dealing with a huge amount of pixels here. But as I move this around carefully, you can see the difference in the area that's masked. So oop, there's the, the foliage. There's the wall without much foliage and go a little bit too far and boom, we're back into the foliage. Okay, so I need to find that, that spot, that magic spot where it gets mostly the wall and very little of the foliage. But here's the thing, this is a mask. So anything that's white will get affected. Anything that's black like this over here will not get affected, which means anything that's gray is gonna be partially affected. So here's something really important to understand about control points. If I add one control point, it applies it exactly as we're seeing here. As I add multiple control points, they compete with each other. And this is why you may have noticed, and let me actually back up and show you this again. I'm gonna turn off this mask and actually delete this control point. When I first added the control point here, so I'm, I'm gonna re-add it, not clicking yet. Notice this area is going to get a little bit brighter. That's because if we go back to the first control point, let me zoom back out here, there we go. If this first control point, if I look at the mask for it, where I darkened the clouds up here, it was darkening these, this part of the mountains, this is not pure black. So this is getting brightened very slightly, or I guess getting darkened, sorry, it's getting darkened very slightly and having structure enhanced very slightly because that's what this control point is doing. It's affecting this area primarily, but it is getting a little bit here. Same kind of idea if we look at this one, let's look at that mask, let's see, is that mask affecting this at all? It is, right? So this slight darkening, slight increase of structure is slightly affecting this part of the scene here. So if I want to have this and or this adjustment not affect the, uh, the foreground here at all, then I need to add a control point to this part of the scene and not do anything to it or even counter what's being done up here. So here's what's happening. If I turn these back off, so we're still looking at these control points being applied. I grab a control point. When I first drop it on here, you're going to see this part of the scene brighten up a little bit. See, so very little, but what we've just done is we have countered this effect. If you wanna see this countering effect as a mask, what I can do is go to this mask and enable it and this one here that is not being shown as a mask, we're now seeing the results of effectively this minus this. If I delete this, that gets brighter. If I add this back in, that gets darker. And I can expand this out to really kind of try and isolate this area out. If I enable this mask, we are now going to see both masks together. But remember, this control point is independent from this one. So the work that I've done here, darkening and increasing the structure, is not being affected here. This is saying that this mask, this control point will affect this area independently. I've just chosen to view both masks together, but it doesn't have any bearing on the end result. However, when I go in here and I have this effect applied here, this effect applied here, now I go to this one, which has now removed these effects and I start manipulating this, this is being applied independently of these. And there is always going to be some degree of overlap, right? As I brighten this up all the way, we see a little bit of that affecting up here, but it's pretty minimal. We are seeing more of it affect up here, but these, these control points are always kind of competing with each other, if you will, but this is how we use them to control the area that we want and to block the area that we don't want. So with all that said, again, let me start this over. I'm gonna add a control point onto the wall. We're gonna look at the mask of just the wall. Let's zoom in nice and close in here and find that spot where I get as much wall and as little foliage as possible. We're gonna call it right about there. And then I'm gonna add another control point. And when I add this one, the mask is not enabled. So if I click on this, we're going to knock out that background. And suddenly all of that that I just showed you was to get to this point where I've now isolated that wall very, very cleanly. But it's just this area of the wall. We see that wall there, we see the letters on the side here. But look, there's the wall here that does not have that effect applied. Well, all we have to do is start repeating the process. So I'm going to take this control point here. I'm going to option drag this to drag a new version of it over here. Now, remember, I haven't actually done anything to this yet. So option dragging it right now, it's not like I'm taking advantage of already, um, uh, sorry, of keeping the effects that I've already done. All I'm doing by option dragging this over is I am 
keeping the fact that that mask preview is turned on. So this allows me to, by option dragging these out, kind of quickly build up a mask that will show the areas that I want to affect. I'm going to eventually group these together to make a single slider that will adjust everything for the wall, but uh, but we're not there yet. So I've got this on here, maybe find a different position. Actually, that works pretty well. I'm gonna option drag this down to this part of the wall. Uh, maybe I option drag another one of the negative control points or the blocking control points. Let's do another one over here. Let's get another block. We can see where it's starting to you know kind of leak through. It's blocked down here as well. And you know, this is pretty good, right? We've got the wall here very nicely cleared out. Let's actually add another negative one up here. Um, oops, make that a little bit bigger there. And we've done a pretty good job of isolating all that out. All right, so now what I wanna do is group these together. So if I go in, let me just not group these. Let me turn off the masks everywhere. If I go into this one control point and I brighten that up, that's gonna affect that part of the wall, but not the others. Now I don't wanna to have to go into each one of these control points and do those same changes. So instead what I'll do is I'll take this one and I'm gonna command click, um, maybe um, um, control click on a PC. I'm gonna command click on the ones that I wanna group. So I'm looking for the control points that are on the wall. So let's see, one, two, three, four, I think that's all of them. And then I'll group them using this button here. Click on the group and it has grouped those all together. And now I can adjust the brightness for those all simultaneously. I'll do the same thing for the foliage ones. So let's see, it's that one, that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. And I'm gonna group those. And now I have one group that's for the foliage. So let's take that and go the opposite direction. Let's make that bright, uh, darker and make this a little bit brighter. Maybe add a little structure into that. Uh, let's see here, contrast, I wanna some contrast to it as well. Maybe a little bit. All right, we're getting there. And now let's go and zoom back out and let's see our, our results so far. So again, having those control points as groups allows us to do that. Now I've got um, other parts of the wall here. I was zoomed in so close, I missed all of this. So these ones that are already part of the group, if I start option dragging these over, it is going to keep them as part of that group. So I can let's add a couple more points into here and then I'll go to my dark group here and add a few more there. Let's make that a little bit bigger, add some more down here. And over to here, there we go. Are we good? Are we happy? I think we're pretty good. Maybe I can add one more over here, yeah, right about there. Okay, so there we go. Now I've got the wall really popping out. Again, I have that control over just the wall area, taking that, brightening that or darkening that, changing the structure on it and so on. And I can really add that drama in there. And I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. Now let's do a little compare back to the original. And here's what I was saying, you're gonna be blown away. If you look at the difference between these, it is pretty, pretty remarkable what we've done. And this is what I've done in you know five or 10 minutes. There's so much more that we could do in here, um, spending a little bit more time on it, but that is, that is a pretty dramatic result. Now, this particular photo, I think it could benefit from kind of a sapia, old worldy look. So I'm gonna scroll down here and go to finishing adjustments. And let's go to toning. And there's lots of different tones to start with. Uh, there's blues and, and kind of magentas and so on, but I think, a good old sapia style is gonna work out really well for that. So let's just add that in there. And then just because I can, I'm gonna add an image border onto this. And these image borders that are built in, there's a variety of presets. You can choose one that kind of works for that photo. And these are all pretty good for this. So let's choose something like, let's just say, I don't know, say that one. I kind of like that. Within this, you have adjustments over the size of that border. So you can play with the size, you can play with the thickness of the border itself by adjusting the spread of that. As you can see how that's changing in there. You can make that a little bit cleaner, a little bit rougher. So I want it to be very clean border, very rough border. Um, you have all these controls. And then there's this random varying, var varying, varying this button. It's just a uh, random seed generator. Every time you click it, it just drops in a new random number and you get a variance, variance to, the, uh, to the edge on there. So, you know, pretty cool, right? Let me do another comparison. I mean, from that to that, it's kind of awesome. I mean, I wouldn't mind having that on my wall. In fact, I think I do have this on my wall at home. <laughs> I like it. All right, I'm gonna hit save on there. And we've got some other places to go with other photos in here, but let's see if there's any questions before we do that. Could you use Define to do the noise reduction before going to SilverFX Pro? Um, you certainly could. 
uh, that would allow you to have more control over where the noise goes. Is that right? Define, I always get these confused because I don't use these very often. Um, define, yeah, yeah, define, that's the right one, sorry. I was confusing define and sharpener. I, sometimes, sometimes one just loses the plot. Um, so yes, define allows you to do localized noise reduction. So yeah, if you had an area that you wanted to reduce the noise from a specific part of the image while not reducing it in others, then certainly you could do that. Um, keep in mind that once you're, and sorry, just to add to that, I would try first with the deep prime, just because the deep prime denoising algorithm is so much more advanced than what's in define. But if you need localized adjustments, then define is a great place to do that. Um, keep in mind that once you, do your core processing in PhotoLab and you generate that TIFF file to send off to a NIC plugin, you can send it to as many plugins as you want. You can send it through any or all of them. Every time you do something, you process, you save that out, and then you open up it in another filter. I, I would say if you're going to do that, just be aware of the process. Think the process through in advance. Things like highlight recovery you want to do while you're still in RAW. So you do that in your RAW before you send it off to your first TIFF. Now you've got your first TIFF, should you be doing some denoising? Should you be doing some effects first? Probably doing denoising, that would probably be a good next place to go. So do your localized denoising from there and then send that off to whatever effects you're going to do. If you're gonna be adding grain to your image, make sure you do that at the very end. You want that as the last step in there because you don't want to be fighting the grain with the denoise, right? If you added grain and then denoised it, you would kind of effectively be trying to get rid of the grain. So denoising gets rid of the noise, adding the grain adds the grain. And if someone out there is going, why would you do both? Haven't you just gotten back to where you started? No, the pattern, the actual pattern of the texture of noise is quite different than grain. Noise looks like digital noise. Grain looks like film grain. And so it's a very common process to remove noise, remove digital noise, and then add film grain on top of it. And that is um, effect especially effective way to get rid of really, really stubborn noise that you just can't eliminate completely. Add, as, take off as much as you can, add a little bit of grain on top of it, and that will kind of disguise the noise to look more like grain. And you don't even have to add very much when you do it with that. Your goal is just to uh, hide the noise. Just a little bit of grain on top of it will do a remarkable job at that. How do you option drag? It's the same as duplicating a control point. Yes, when you option drag, you are duplicating the control point. So you could, there's a button in there to select a control point and duplicate it. Option dragging it is just a shortcut. It's just like in the Finder or in, um, in Windows Explorer, if you hold down the option key and on a Windows keyboard, it's option slash alt key. If you hold that down while you're dragging a file, you'll duplicate the file. Same thing in here with the control point. Hold that down while you drag the control point, you duplicate the control point. I always find skies difficult. When I use structure and darken for dramatic effect, often it brings noise into it. What would you do to stop that? So that goes back to the grain discussion. If you are, if you're adding so much structure that you're pulling noise out of your file, then grain is the way to hide that. Now you could go multiple steps, right? You could take your, and this would be a great use case for define. You could take your, your sky photo, uh, take it into SilverX Pro, add your contrast and structure that gives you the look that you want. But now you've you've introduced, you haven't introduced noise, you've enhanced the noise that was there. Um, whether it's because it's an old, not a very high quality sensor, or it was shot in very high ISO to begin with, whatever the reason, you have now added noise that you couldn't see before. Incidentally, if at that point you see that, I would say back out of it for a minute, do um, apply the um, the deep prime noise algorithm to the photo first, even if it doesn't look like there's noise there. Apply the deep prime, bring it back into the filter, try again with your adjustments. And I'm gonna show you in a little bit here how to go back and forth like that and not lose the work that you've done. Um, I'll try your adjustment again. If that structure is still pulling that noise into it, go ahead and save that, apply that, and then open up and define and see if define can eliminate some of that noise. Important thing to know, deep prime, only works on raw files. And Deep Prime is, is a denoising algorithm that is doing more than looking at the noise pattern. It's actually looking at the metadata of the sensor and the lens combination and applying a custom algorithm for that lens and, and camera combo that cannot be done to a TIFF file, can only be done to the raw. So you'll find that once you have round tripped to NIC plugin and back again, you no longer have the ability to apply Deep Prime. So you gotta do that at the raw level apply it, come back. And at that point, you do need more noise reduction. Then that's when you go into the define and try that out. So 
hopefully that answers kind of a long-winded answer, but it's a great question. And I think that that's a, a very effective way to uh, to try that out. Thank you. How do you group control points again? You uh, command or shift, I think works as well. Again, on Windows, it'd be control click, on Mac, command click, or hold down the shift key, I think will work too. And you're selecting multiple ones that way, just while you're holding it down, click on each one, and then click on the group button. It's a, there's a group button in there. Um, I'll try to remember to point it out again. We're going to go back into it in a moment here. Okay, uh, where are we on time? Good, we're good on time. I'm going to, let's see here. Um, yeah, my last photo in here that I want to play with is not technically a landscape, but it's just it's a really good black and white conversion. So I really wanted to do this one. Uh, all right, I'm gonna reset this. I mean, it's kind of a landscape. It's just, it's a uh, man-made landscape. There we go. This is the St. Louis Gateway Arch. Um, I, I really like this photo. I shot this photo quite a while ago, but I really like this photo and uh, we're gonna play with it. So I'm going to maybe pull down highlights a little bit. Yeah, not really. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna, there's nothing I need to do in here. I'm just gonna send this thing off to Silverfix Pro. Now for this one, we're going to start with the film looks, the film presets, because there's all kinds of really cool looks that are based off of the film stock. We've already explored things like brightness, contrast, and structure, the selective adjustments, the color filters, and so on. But what we haven't explored yet is film types. If you click on this film types drop down, oops, 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 let me make this a little, make this a little easier to see. Let's hide all of that, and here we go. If you click on this drop down, you'll see a long list of different film options in here. These are all emulations. This is Ilford Pan F plus 50. This is a very low ISO film, black and white film type that the folks at DxO have labored intensively to make this film look, make this emulation look this way. Um, we've got, you'll see they're grouped by ISO. So there's your very low ISO and then it gets higher and higher. We get into like the Fuji Neopan or an Ilford HP5 Plus and a Kodak ones, right? Kodaks are very popular. And if you've never shot with film before, then you're looking at this thinking, why do I care what the names are? Just roll through a list of options. But thing is, if you have shot with film before, then you might look at these and go, oh, I remember when I used to shoot with and you find that film stock in here and you go, yeah, it actually does look like that. You know, Ilford Delta 3200 unique look, very high contrast. Look at the brights almost blown out. The shadows very, very crunchy. This is how that film looked. And you would choose as a photographer, you would choose the film stock to suit a particular need or personal preference or you know, whatever. You can recreate most of those in here and that's really cool. But it also gives you the opportunity to just play with different options. Just like playing with the presets, you can go through here and just go through, roll through and see what film stock you like the look of. Now, I know that I'm going to go for a higher ISO one in here. So I'm going to kind of go up to like the Neopan P3200, TMAX3200. That was a really, 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 really popular film stock. So that's a, always a like easy one to go to. And you can see it's 3200, but it's not really high. It's not really grainy. So it's high ISO, low grain, great film stock. Um, you know, some of these are a bit flatter. So you get a bit more of the structure coming in and so on and so on. So anyway, it's kind of fun. I'm gonna actually start with the 3200 T-Max because I, I used to shoot T-Max and I think it's kind of fun to go back to that. So here we've got this uh, starting point. It's looking pretty good, but we need some structure in here. We've got two of the things in this photo that are the best for structure, clouds and metal. Metal is so cool for structure. Watch this, this is like, this is a heavy metal demo right here. Let's go for selective adjustments, grab that control point, drop it on the building in here on the side of the building if you want to preview that there we go let me go ahead and turn off the web camera again uh, if you want to preview the mask of course i can enable the mask and i can see exactly what's going to be affected make that nice and big in there if i want to block out the sky drop another control point onto here to block that out can start adding multiples of these if needed so there's option dragging out to to duplicate that or i can click this duplicate button right here and that will duplicate it and that puts it right next to the original and then i can position that wherever i want and for the person who had asked about grouping them, I've got this one selected. I'll hold down the shift key and select on multiples of those. That works. Or I can do this and hold down the command key, select multiples of those. And then this button right here is the group button. Click that. And now they act as one. What this means is just to kind of really drive this point home, I'm going to undo that group. Um, if I take this slider and take the brightness, oops, my group is still together. Um, ungroup. Oh, they're all selected. Okay, sorry. So I go back to, where was that first one? There, this one here. 
and I take the brightness slider all the way down on here, and this one, and I take the brightness slider all the way up, and we're not seeing the effect because I'm in the mask view. These are independent, right? So this one had the brightness down, this one had the brightness up, this one has no brightness done to it at all. Once I group these, so select all of those, group them together, now this slider affects all of them simultaneously. So you'll notice you don't even have controls on these. The only control you have here is the size of that, but the actual control is on one of these. It's it's just the first one that you selected. It doesn't actually matter where the controls are. It'll just show up on the first one in the stack. Uh, but now those are all being controlled together. That's how that whole grouping things works. Okay, um, let me reset that and let's get out of the mask view. And here's this one here. Let's add some structure to this thing. Oh yeah, look at that. That's so cool. It's like really awesome structure showing up in the metal in here. I think it's just so neat looking. Okay, so we've got that. All right now let's do something in the clouds. Let's add another control point over here. Make that nice and big. Crank up the structure in the clouds. Take the brightness down. Oh, right, I have this whole other group here that I <laughs> eliminate that entirely. Um, I'm now fighting, oops, undo, select the group. There we go, delete that. I'm fighting against my group. Delete the group. Oh, it ungrouped it. Now let me delete the individual ones. And there we go, now we're back, okay. So there's that one big control point. Crank up that structure, maybe take the brightness down, turn it up, turn it down. Yeah, we'll take it down. That's really cool there. Option drag that down here. Ooh, that's neat. Let's take that dark sky there, make that super dramatic. Awesome. Okay, so this is, you know, this is cool, right? But who can spot the problem? <laughs> this sensor was filthy. There is spots, look at these sensor spots all over the place that I didn't even see before when the file was flat, but now they are showing up everywhere. Now I could apply this and then go back into PhotoLab and start retouching them, but I would rather do the retouching at the raw level. So what I wanna do is not lose all the work that I've done. Yeah, okay, it took me 30 seconds, but uh, you know, maybe let's just say that I spent a lot more time and I do not wanna lose all of this. So I can save all of this as a preset. If I go down to the custom tab in here and I click on plus, and then I'll type in arch, save that as a preset, hit okay. And that's that. But here's the problem. That preset, we can even tell by the thumbnail here, it does not save the control points. Presets don't save control points. But there is a hidden secret command to save a preset with the control points. And that is if you hold down the shift key and click on this plus. There is no indicator of this change. There's nothing that tells you this is happening. It is a secret. But I held down the shift key. So now I'm going to call this arch uh, plus CP plus control points. And I'll click OK. And we can already see the difference in the in the preview here. But now that that's done, I'm gonna cancel this. I'm going to now go in and retouch this, but how in the world am I going to retouch these when I can't even see the spots? So here's another little trick for you. I'm gonna turn on my curves and I'm gonna draw a really dramatic, really hideous curve to really enhance the contrast. And as I move this around, you'll start to see some of those spots showing up. There we go, there's a bunch of them down here. So I'm not gonna fix all of these because out of the interest of time, we're almost at the end of our slot here but I'm gonna fix a few of them. So I'll grab my retouching tool, the little Band-Aid tool here. I can change the um, size of this by holding the command or on a PC holding down the control key. I can change the softness of that by holding down shift and dialing that, or you can just drag your sliders down here. And I'm just going to go in here and start clicking. Oops. I'm gonna start knocking out some of these, some of these sensor spots. So I'm just gonna go very quickly and just start booming these out. We're not gonna do all of them, but I do wanna get rid of the most egregious ones in there. I saw some up here somewhere. I know it. I know there was a really bad one over here somewhere. Where'd it go? Nope, there's one right there. Get rid of that one. And we'll go up to the top here. There's a couple, and then we'll call it a day. I'm sure I'm not getting all of them, but that at least gets some of them. Okay, that's good. Let's exit out of here. Zoom back out. Let's not forget to get rid of this crazy tone curve that I did. We'll reset that. And now I'm going to send this back into the Knit Collection back into SolarFX Pro. It's gonna render out a TIFF. It asks if I can overwrite the previous one. I'm gonna say yes, because I didn't actually do anything to it. So go ahead and overwrite that. And boom, boom, boom. There's the default. Go to my custom presets. If I click the first one, it applies the base look, but without the control points. Apply the second one though, and check it out. My control points are back and there we go. So that is how we do it. There's the spots that I missed. I knew I missed some in there. And my control points are back. So that is how you do that. Now I see someone is asking me to explain again how to produce a negative control point. 
to make an area, um, a light area look darker. So again, the, I use the term negative control point because that's what it's called inside of Photo Lab. So if you're in Photo Lab and you're adding competing control points, there it's called a negative control point. Inside of the NIC plugins, it's not actually called a negative control point, but it's doing the same thing. I'm adding a control point that is not doing anything that is in effect canceling out the other control point. So just to make all that really clear again, let's go, uh, let's take a look at this. Or I wanna do this. Let me reset my, my control points, get rid of all of those. And I'll add a big one here. And let's look at that as a mask. So there is a control point added to the cloud. If I just click on add another control point and I drop it up here, the mask is not enabled for that. So this control point is hiding, this control point is blocking out this part of the sky um, from this one. And the only reason that I can see the part that is dropping out is because this one has the mask enabled and this one does not. Again, the mask being enabled or disabled has no bearing on the actual effect of the image. This is just for your own reference so that you can look at it and see what's being affected. If I turn on just that mask, there's just that mask. There's just that mask. There's both, oops, there's no mask. There's both masks in there. At that point, I see that everything's affected. So what this tells me, if with everything affected, if I was to take both of these together and change the brightness at the same time, then the entire image effectively is having the brightness changed. If, however, I only select one of these, now it is only gonna affect the brightness for that part of the image because this control point is effectively asking, acting as a, um, as a negative control point in this case, when in reality, what it's really doing is it's just saying, no, 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 I have control over this part of the image and I'm choosing to do nothing. This part of the image, this one has control over and you are choosing to make it darker. I can now go in here and I can make that one brighter to really counter it, or I can say, well, let's bring a little bit of the darkness down and pull that down a little bit like so. So they're individual control points. They're not technically called negative control points. That's what they're called in Photolab, but I've gotten so used to calling them that, that it really makes sense when you're showing it as far as what a control point is doing. It is effectively acting as a negative control point, but in reality, it's just another control point. So there we go. That brings us to the end of our time. I hope you found that interesting and entertaining and enjoyable. Um, again, I'm Photo Joseph. Thank you for attending today. I will see you all in the next demo. Bye-bye.